Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Hill Country. I'm David Gross and I will be the service associate this morning. Um, I don't think I saw any guests, but if I, there's some out there lurking, welcome. Uh, now is the time we have the announcements. So uh, if you could wave at Justin, he will uh, let you in if you have any announcements. All right, Mike. Am I there? Yes, go ahead. Okay, just uh, one little amendment. I, I think last week I told you I'd heard about tax law change where you can make charitable contributions in 2020 and write them off without having to itemize. That is true, but your limit is $300. Well, so I just wanted to make that clear. It's not it, it's not an unlimited contribution amount, but it's three hundred. Okay. Any other announcements? Oh, Sarah, one second. Let me get you on there. Go ahead. It's the Christmas card on wheels today. Uh, everyone at once between one and one fifteen. All right. Looking forward to that. And uh, I know Amanda and Mark will be there. I have to work tonight, so sadly I won't be able to do it. But uh, yeah, I hope you all have a great time. Any other announcements? Okay, um, now it's time for the chalice lighting and I'll turn that over to Chuck Freeman. Well, Buenos Dias, Church of the Hill Country there in Kerrville. It's great to be with you, even if it's, it's from my uh, couch where I've been in about 15 congregations this year and never left this couch. <laughs> but uh, I miss seeing you in person. I can't wait for the time when we can each other again, shake hands, share a meal together, hug necks. And it's beautiful to see so many of you that I've known for years and appreciate so much your spirit and your commitment to justice. Now I'm going to do a little call and response here for the chalice sliding, and then I'm going to pause a moment and do a poem from Rumi. I know, I know you're all muted, but there in your Living rooms and dens. Go ahead and shout out the response. And the way you'll know you're doing this right is if the cats run for cover and the dogs howl. So your response is going to be, we light this chalice. All right? We gather this morning on the edge of dictatorship and democracy, so... We light this chalice. We gather this morning on the edge of demagoguery and decency, so... We light, we light this chalice. We gather this morning on the edge of racism and pluralism, so... We light, we light this chalice. chalice. We gather this morning on the edge of despair and hope. So, we light, light this chalice. chalice. As one voice, we pledge to follow the path of light and liberation. So, we light, we light this chalice. chalice. I want to share a reading from you, from the poet Rumi. You can probably relate to this. It's called The Guest House. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. 
even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. And uh, thank you, Chuck. And now we uh, will do the mission statement and the affirmation. And uh, Justin will put them up on the screen and Please join with me in reading our mission statement and our affirmation. We journey together, guided by you, you value, to see, nurture, and serve our loving church family, our community, and our world. The doctrine of the church is love. The quest of truth is a sacrament and service is a prayer. And this is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humanity in fellowship as we strive to have all souls grow into harmony with the divine. And now Anybody else? Okay. So um, next, I want to do a reading. Uh, let me uh, and I'll take just a minute to introduce it. The, the reading is a, a poem, "Christmas Bells," by the 19th-century uh, American poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, um, who happens to be happens to spend his life in my home state of Maine, but that's not relevant. Um, and uh, this 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 poem, Christmas Bells, and many of you will be uh, familiar with it uh, because several verses of it were taken and made into the hymn, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, the Christmas carol, I heard the bells on Christmas Day that I think a lot of us are familiar with. But anyway, uh, Wadsworth was an ardent abolitionist, and um, in fact, uh, he was a very successful and popular poet and made a good uh, living from his uh, uh, writing, and in the years leading up to the Civil War, while he was an active abolitionist, he very quietly, without any fanfare, uh, used uh, some of his uh, income to buy uh, slaves out of slavery, to buy their freedom. And then, um, but uh, he had sunk into, as the Civil War came on, he sunk into a deep depression and then his, his son uh, ran away to join the Union Army. Um, uh, of course, Wadsworth, uh, Longfellow was a ardent supporter of the Union Army, but, uh, but was horrified by the bloodshed on both sides and by the terrible destruction wrought by the war. And then his son in 1863 got wounded in battle quite seriously. And uh, Wadsworth, uh, Longfellow went down to Washington to bring him back to Maine. To Portland, and it, and he sat down and wrote this poem uh, that expresses the kind of conflict between the joys that we want to feel on Christmas Day and the realities that we're still facing. Um, as uh, we all know, the realities we're facing right now that make the Christmas spirit sort of contradictory, if you will. Anyway, Christmas bells. I heard the bells on Christmas day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And I thought how as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men, till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day, a voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. But then from each black accursed mouth, the cannon thundered in the south, 
and with the sound the carols drowned the peace on earth with Wilson and it was as if an earthquake rent the hearthstones of a continent and made forlorn a household born of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. All right. Um, now we come to our offering, just to mention, of course, that as you know, the church is entirely self-supporting based on the voluntary generosity of our members and friends. Our expenses continue even when we can't meet in our church, of course. So please drop off or mail your contributions to the church at our mailing address on Barnett Street. I think Chuck will introduce the second song that we're going to have now. And thank you so much for that reading and uh, very moving. And thank you to Meredith for the uh, musical choices. That was awesome. Rendition, and I know we're going to have a great closing song as well of her choosing. So th th those things make the service much more effective. And as I like to say, uh, good music will uplift a mediocre sermon every time. <laughs> so that is my uh, fervent hope this morning. And now, Chuck, uh, let's turn it over to you for the sermon. Thank you. I'm going to do this sermon in two movements. So in the, after the first movement, I'll invite us in just to a few moments of meditation and go into the second movement. Since my house burned down, I now own a better view of the rising moon. This is from the Japanese poet Mishide, performed by Ken Fight, who called himself an itinerant fool. And don't we need more holy fools? Don't we need more itinerant fools in our world today? Now this pandemic is not only ravaging the globe with death, but is revealing the charred rubble of our failed systems. Early on in the EU, the countries that had the worst trouble with the pandemic were the ones affected by austerity measures due to the 2008 financial collapse of our Wall Street and financial institutions. And of course, those people who perpetrated this fraud were never brought to justice. In fact, some of them are probably going to be back in the cabinet coming up. And now in the EU, they're having new lockdowns. In the United States, the most charitable thing you could say is we've had a slow response. We witnessed time and time and time and time again a car carnival barker with politics over science. One of the beautiful things about our faith is that we know that science and faith are not at odds with one another. They can form an integrated whole. But yet, in one political party, in one segment of our society now, it's become the thing to do, to be stupid when it comes to science, to ignore science, to act like science is irrelevant. Whereas every day, these same people are employing silence, uh, science and trusting silence in every aspect of their life. A virus is not susceptible, susceptible to propaganda. 
You may deny its impact, but it may cost you your life. And certainly it's cost the lives of all kinds of innocent people. And for people to be mocked and bullied for wearing masks, I don't like to wear a mask, but it's a very simple thing. And it could have saved likely 25%, if not more, of the lives lost. We have a lame duck president who's now super spreader in chief, along with his lackeys. They're gonna be holding all kind of live events with no mask, no social distancing. We have 4% of the world's population and 25% of the world's cases. The most powerful nation on earth and ignorance and stupidity have ruled rather than science. And now we're approaching 300,000 300, people dead in our nation, many of them senseless deaths. We've seen the charred rubble of our broken healthcare system. States competing with each other the federal government and other nations for medical and protective equipment. And I'm pretty sure we're gonna see the same thing happening with this uh, vaccine. You're gonna see all kind of jockeying and people competing with each other to get the vaccine rather than have a uniform, fair as possible process so everyone who needs it can be vaccinated. Statistics are showing us that our African-American and Latinx people are nearly three times more likely to be infected and twice as likely to die compared to their white neighbors. The epicenters moved from New York and New Jersey initially, then to the Navajo Nation. It was anyone here aware that the Navajo Nation for about six weeks was the epicenter? almost double the cases of New York per capita. Then it moved to the South and the Southwest. And now virtually every state is seeing incre increases in the COVID-19 with deaths topping over 3,000 daily this week. But you see, none of this is new. This system our system was economically and politically engineered to advantage privileged white males. Those of you who know your history will know that the only people who were able to vote initially were white male Protestant landowners, 21 and over. And th I'm, this is another sermon, but it took 90 years for the regular white guys to be able to vote. So the fallback position of the United States is white male domination and elitism. Let's not be so surprised by that. We're working hard. We worked hard. We will continue to work hard to expand that. But that's the fallback. That's the baseline of what America is about. And don't be fooled by, oh, this is just a big aberration all of a sudden. This, uh, all of a sudden, we, these things are popping up. No, it's not. Our systems are designing precisely what they were engineered to do. Now you look at this Paycheck Protection Program. Once again, like the, our Texas Youth Justice Ministry, we were going to apply for it through our credit union. By the time the credit union got the application up five days later, all the money was gone because the preferred customers of the multinational banks had already sucked up the money. 
did Ruth's Chris Steakhouse really need $20 million in paycheck protection? Did the Los Angeles Lakers need $4.6 million in paycheck protection? Yeah, they gave the money back after they got outed, but I can assure you, had they not been outed publicly, that money would have gone not to the workers, not to the custodians, not to the people picking up the trash, not the people who need it the most, but to those who are already privileged. Did Joel Osteen's mega church in Houston really need paycheck protection? Does a pastor living in a mansion and meeting in the former uh, arena where the Houston Rockets played really need paycheck protection? Our Lieutenant Governor suggested early on after the lockdown that senior Texans, this should have caught the ear of Kerrville, a well-known retirement community, People like you and your neighbors, he said they should be willing to sacrifice their lives to open back the economy in Texas. It didn't have to be an either or. And our governor was caught record in a recording saying and admitting that he knew what reopening the state would spread the virus and now we are seeing his reckless decisions in spade. In your county, Kerr County, over 1,630 cases, plus 28 this week. Texas now has 1.4 million cases, number two in the nation in this grim statistic, almost 24,000 deaths. During Thanksgiving, El Paso ordered its 14th mobile morgue and Lubbock is currently out of ICU beds. But now, in the midst of a 100-year physical pandemic, we are devastated anew by the racism pandemic, a spiritual cancer which is almost 600 years old. Are you aware that the transatlantic slave trade began in Portugal in 1444, and then they began to devise the cancerous ideology of racism to justify their economic exploitation and enslavement of other human beings? I would commend to your reading a book by Ibram X. Kendi called Stamped from the Beginning. It's about a 600 page book. It's very good if you wanna know a history of the ideology of racism in our world. Our nation is traumatized by the police murders of George Floyd Breonna Taylor and Rayshard Brooks, along with the Klan style murder of Ahmed Arbery in Georgia. Protests resisting European co colonialism and police oppression has occurred in over 60 countries and in every continent. This isn't just us. America isn't the only country experiencing this. This is a worldwide phenomenon. Don't you, I, I know you know the, the saying that the sun never set on the British Empire. We're still living in the, the horrible afterwake of colonialism. And buildings are literally being burned down. Statues are coming down, some by force, some by legislative vote. Now, will we claim the insurance and rush to rebuild with the same design flaws? Or is there another path? I'm going to invite you into about 30 seconds 
uh, meditative and reflective silence. Just take a deep breath or so, and then we will come to movement too. Since my house burned down, I now own a better view of the rising moon. Now when this pandemic began, Naomi Klein of The Intercept did an excellent video. She called it coronavirus capitalism. Now I wanna emphasize this is before the racism pandemic raised its ugly head so graphically once more. But one thing that she said in that video is that only crisis produces a real change. And that this pandemic and now adding on the racism pandemic can catalyze an evolutionary leap similar to the one in the 1930s. Now this presidential election is short-term relief. Maybe it's like a person who has asthma and they take a puff of the inhaler and they feel good for a while, but they still have asthma. 74 million Americans voted for cruelty, for dictatorship, for white supremacy, for a person with no principles at all. And you have one political party still acquiescing to this in the main. But we can work toward a Green New Deal. We can work towards health care as a human right. We can work toward equitable taxation and compensation. We can work toward election reform and trying to eradicate voter suppression. We can work towards college education at no charge to students, avoiding crippling debt. Why should a person who wants to get a master's or PhD for their chosen profession and calling going to one, two, three hundred thousand dollars worth of debt. It's going to take them at least half of their life to dig out of. This is the best and the brightest, so-called. And we're going to shackle them from the very beginning with all of this student debt. And we can undo racism. If we constructed it, we can deconstruct it in all of our systems, beginning in the church. Now in UU churches, we don't have graphic racism, but I do believe that we have passive racism, unconscious racism, just by the way our systems are set up. Now in our Texas EU Justice Ministry, which you are one of our visionary members and participants, we now have 36 of our congregations across the state involved in this coalition for justice. We were involved in the national UU The Vote. We had a Texas collaborative. We hired an organizer to work with us. We had over 42,000 touches with under voting populations. 
and you saw that the voting in Texas was off the map. That was partly due to us and so many other groups energized to bring out the vote of people whose votes had been suppressed for generations. For the first time ever, we used our 501c4, which is the IRS designation that allows us to endorse candidates. And so Texujum endorsed, I believe, 31 candidates this time for office. What we know is we have to have better people in office. Since we started this justice ministry in 2013, all of our victories have been, well, we stopped that and we slowed that down and we were able to run the clock on that one and we killed that one. Precious seldom times have we been able to say we, we got a positive affirmative bill passed. So we know that eventually playing defense will wear you out and we want to get better candidates who can allow us to do positive things for the state of Texas. Texujim is involved in Nuevo Laredo with this cruel, nonsensical, demonic, remain in Mexico policy. We're working with a pastor Ortiz who is uh, housing people who are stuck there who can't get their rightful asylum hearings in the United States. And we pray to God this next administration will end this nonsense on day one. We're partnering with the Carrizo Camacrudo tribe and original, the original peoples of Texas going back into the 1500s before the Spanish came in conquest. And we're working with the Carrizo Camacrudo for the first time to stop this nonsensical, idiotic border wall and the building of, of gas pipelines through their sacred lands and sacred burial sites. We're involved in a six session conversation, which will end in January called People of the Land, Healing from the White Supremacy and Colonization Pandemic. Now, what I love about this haiku, it says we now own a better view of the rising moon. We own it. It's not something that is fleeting. Where you're out on the beach in an idyllic setting, and oh, honey, look at that beautiful moon. And you, let's take a picture so we can look back and remember it with nostalgia. No, we own this and we are going to live into this better view of the rising moon. Now, we could obsess over the obsolete ashes or we can transform our structures with rising moon consciousness. And I'm very well aware that this is feminine imagery, feminine energy. And our world desperately needs the feminine energy and spirituality and consciousness right now. Because that consciousness, that goddess consciousness, that feminine energy says, this earth is our home. This earth is sacred. This earth is important. We're not just doing whatever we want to do here in, in, in hopes of some imaginary world off somewhere else. Maybe there is a world somewhere else, but we know we're in this world right now. Why not treat it holy? Why not treat it sacred? Why not be great stewards of this land and all that is in it and all creatures and give up the idea that the human being is the apex of all creation. Why do you have any more right to be here than a salamander? Oh yeah, you got a bigger brain, but you ain't using it too well. So you using people of good heart, good faith, and good will, will lead the way. You look at Arizona and Georgia, what happened in their voting. That didn't happen overnight. That wasn't an aberration. That wasn't a blip on the radar. That's the result of years 
at least a decade, if not more, of grassroots organizing. This is the same path that Texas is on, and we're going to be part of that transformation. So the future will be determined by those who are focused, those who are centered, organized, synergized, and mobilized on the path of their values, and in this case, of universal, ethical, moral values that our faith and so many others represent. So as we own and act on rising moon consciousness, the politically impossible will become the politically inevitable. Amen. Amen. Certainly thought provoking. Um, so now uh, we have the uh, congregational response. So uh, wave your hand again and Justin will enable your microphone. All right, Jill, one second, let me get you on here. Chuck, I, I am practically in tears. Uh, that, thank you for all of that. But my question is, um, I try to be a good UU, I try to be a good citizen, I try to be a good member of the human race. But in my little enclosed world of struggles and issues that I have, I can't do very much. And I guess that gives me a sense of powerlessness. What little, I, I mean, I send out letters for the vote. I, you know, I do what, what tiny things I can do, but I want to do more. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Well, let me just say this. Do never underestimate anything that you do. Thank you. you know that the story about the monarch butterflies that y'all know that one where yeah. you know this monarch butterfly has no idea the impact they're having, right? So, you know, any seed that you sow, any thought that you have, any prayer that you pray any letter that you write, any conversation that you have. It's all moving in the right direction. And at the end of the day, the, the question isn't really, what did we accomplish? I think the, the, the question is, were we true to our values? One of my favorite songs in our hymnal is called, Just As Long As I Have Breath. Just as long as you have breath, what values are you breathing into and breathing out of? And hey, I know, believe me, I, I feel the frustration because I'm going to be down there at the Capitol in January and beyond. And I'm going to see a lot of nonsense and a lot of idiotic stuff and a lot of uh, people trying to lord their power over others. And it's frustrating as I'll get out. But here's what I know. When we first went down there in 2013, they had no earthly idea who the hell we were. But now they know who we are and we're having an impact. So never underestimate anything that you do. I understand the frustration. I understand the feeling of helplessness. You just keep on keeping on. You do anything you can do. And that all moves in ways that we don't even understand. I have a couple of thoughts. Um, am I on, Justin? Yes. Um, uh, in, in response, uh, first, your, your closing sounded so much like the uh, quote attributed to Martin Luther King Jr., although he really got it for some 19th century minister, which is the arc of history is long, but it bends toward justice. Um, but I've always thought, every time I hear that, I have a mixed feeling of, well, maybe, or I do hope so. Uh, it doesn't seem inevitable to me. Uh, uh, and uh, 
So you, I, I live with that doubt, that, that gnawing concern that, that our hope may not be realized because the dark forces we face are, let us admit, strong. Um, but I also wanted to say that in the Christmas season, uh, that, uh, uh, and I know that within you, you church, there's this debate about how much we should emphasize any Christian connection, but my radicalism and my political beliefs all come out of the Sermon on the Mount. And, uh, and, I, I, and I think this is a good time of the year for even you, you, to acknowledge and remember uh, the great message that, that we were given all those uh, millennia ago that remain as urgent as they were then, as, un, as unfulfilled as they were then, and, uh, and yet a, 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 great, uh, a great tradition that we should honor and respect and try to live up to. Beautifully stated. I, and I, I think things don't become inevitable on their own. We have to work and work and work and do our work and, you know, help it along. Um, so, you know, when, when, not to get too partisan, but when Bernie Sanders started his whole thing several years ago, healthcare as a human right and all this, that's now moved itself into the mainstream a political thought in America, whereas before that was total political heresy. So yeah. people who are committed, people who are urgent, people who persevere, we can, and it's, that's inevitable. I don't know, it may, it may take another four years or more, but we're gonna have universal health care coverage in America, whether it's Medicare for all or however we put it together, that's going to happen. And that didn't happen on its own. So I get what you're saying, but yeah, we have to work. And that's why, uh, that's why we organize and mobilize and synergize. Those, the people that do that are the ones that will prevail. Those values are the ones that will endure. All right, Carolyn, let me get your microphone on. Dill, I'm amazed that you think you're not doing enough. You do so much. And look around at our faces. Look at this group, okay? This tiny little church, okay? Look at working the polls, Kirkconnect, Casa, you know, every single person here contributes a lot. I mean, it's, I mean, helping the environment, saving nature, um, animals you know saving animals uh every single person here does more than the average person i think you know to help okay so we're on the right track and never ever think that you're not doing enough thank you yeah um, jill let me turn your microphone back on i just want to respond to carolyn and how much i appreciate her uh I think my greatest contribution right now is that I'm raising a 14 year old who has a huge heart. Uh, her values are in the right place. And she, she is going to be my gift to the future. And so I can take a lot of comfort in that. So thank you, Carolyn, for reminding me. Yep. Well, I know a woman She's actually preached in Kerrville, a UU. She homeschooled four children who were awesome human beings. And then once the nest was empty, she, she felt like, I don't have a career. I don't know where I'm going. I feel lost. I feel like I'm a failure. And I said to her often, if, quote, the only thing, quote, unquote, the only thing you accomplished was raising these four awesome children who are excelling and doing decent, beautiful things in the world. What more could you ask for in a life? All right, anybody else? Uh, 
Thank you, Meredith, for these wonderful musical selections. It's so enriching and nurturing. Um, and now we've come to the uh, extinguishing of the chalice. Uh, Chuck, would you have some final words? Yes, I do. I'm going to plead with you. I'm not much of a pleader in general, but please be true to your spiritual DNA as Unitarian Universalists. We're not people who sit around in our comfortable churches or pews, or in this case, our comfortable uh, living rooms and dens and kitchens with our house shoes on, whining and complaining and becoming cynical and in despair. We are people who step out, we step forward, we lead the way, we're involved in changing the world, we're involved in transforming systems. And here's what we know. We don't know how long it's going to take. I don't know how long it's gonna take, but we will be in Texas and we win, will together with our allies and the people of good heart and good faith and good will who voted by over 6 million strong and beyond the pretender for decent human values, we will bend it towards justice. Amen. Um. So with the extinguishing of the chalice, we come to the end of our service as, as usual. Um, and uh, let me thank Chuck uh, for a terrific sermon. And I, I felt the whole service, was, uh, the music was great uh, and uh, uh, very inspiring. And so uh, now, as usual, with the service concluded, we uh, will turn everyone's mic on and just have some informal conversation for a few minutes uh, before we.